Well, good morning, everybody. This has been a great, great morning. Thank you, everybody. And uh, we can continue by looking at the book of Mark. So you can turn to Mark chapter 1 or pull that up on your device or follow along on screen. Brand new series in Mark starting today. I am pumped about this series, you guys. We're calling it Power of the King of Kings. And I want to just kind of tell you guys a bit of the thought process about how we chose this. And actually, I, I, let's take a step back for a minute and think about why we do sermons at all, ever. Like, what are you doing here right now? <laughs> um, I've been thinking about this a lot this week. What, are, what do we hope happens here? You know, what's the purpose of coming together and hearing the Word of God? Whether it's in this setting whether uh, it's your personal time in the Bible um, or your kids hearing the Bible down the hall or you're in a flock or a Bible study, whatever it is, what's the purpose? And um, I, I know us, Calvary, and I know that we and churches like ours would answer that question, we're here to learn, right? That's what we would say. We're here to learn. We're here to learn about the Bible. We're here to learn about God and our walk with God. And we are... That's not a wrong answer, but it's not a complete answer. I want to propose to you that the reason we look to the Word of God, whether it's in this setting or any other, is it's not for information, it is for transformation. Because in the Word of God, we encounter God himself, and then he changes our lives. And if that's not what's going on, if it's purely academic, then we're just wasting our time. Really. And it's easy, isn't it? I mean, it's easy to make church, Bible study, academic. It's easy to try to uh, make God a list of bullet points. Here's God. This is what he's like. Now we know the answers. I mean, we, we do this. Um, Tozer, some of you guys know Tozer, he called this um, reducing God to manageable terms. And that's what we do. We, we come together and, and boy, if, we're, if what we're doing in a gathering like this is finding some manageable terms so that we've gotten hold of God, man, we're missing it. And so um, I just, I want to propose that the reason that we do these things is so that God can change our lives. And this is what the thought process was about the Gospel of Mark, because what does Mark focus on as he's writing about the life of Jesus? He focuses on how Jesus is this powerful king that would blow your mind. And so we're going to come week by week and encounter Jesus, not just learn facts about Jesus, but actually encounter Jesus himself in his word and be in awe of him. And respond to that. That's why we're here. And that's, that's our goal in this series. So um, quick background sketch about this gospel. Who is Mark and what is, what's, uh, what's he writing about? Um, Mark is actually not his name. His name is John. He's called John Mark. Everybody seemed to be named John back then. Or Mary and actually, Mary was his mom, was another Mary in the Bible. And Mary um, was probably a wealthy woman. The early church had gatherings in her home. Remember, that's how the early church gathered. And still, in a lot of places in the world, that's how churches gather. Not in a building like this, which is fine, and we're grateful. But back then, and still many places, gatherings are in homes. So Mark grew up with a church gathering in his home. And he became a ministry companion of Paul and Barnabas. As they went out on a missionary journey, he joined them. And then he, for whatever reason, bailed. You remember that? We talked about this a few weeks ago. Mark didn't want to, for whatever reason, continue. And so he quit. And he went home. And uh, after that, Paul was pretty done with Mark. Like, okay, you bailed on us. We can't trust you. And he didn't want Mark to be his companion anymore. Barnabas, the son of encouragement, he kept giving Mark second chances and Mark accompanied him in ministry. And then Mark eventually accompanied the apostle Peter for ministry. He got to hang out with some cool people, right? 
He, he accompanied Peter, and Peter called Mark his son. That's how close they were and the kind of companionship that they had. So he was a companion of Peter. Um, historical tradition tells us Peter sent Mark to Egypt, and Mark actually started the church in Egypt, which became quite a pillar of Christianity in those early days. Uh, we also have a lot of historical um, confirmation that Mark got a lot of this info that we read from Peter. So as Mark is ministering with Peter, Peter is giving Mark these eyewitness testimonials of when Peter was with Jesus. And eventually Mark writes them down in this book that we have now. And the way Mark does that, the way he assembles the story, Mark is very fast-paced, very aggressive in his language. Um, it's kind of like, uh, maybe you could think of Mark as like the blockbuster summer Hollywood version of the four Gospels. And he just plunges us right in and drags us along through the story of Jesus. So um, some of you, that, that will really connect with you. And it, it probably would have connected with a Roman audience. Mark seems to be writing to the Romans who are Christians or interested in, in Christianity here. Um, he speaks in a way that they would understand. He uses a lot of their terminology. Uh, some people have called Mark barbarous and unrefined in the way he writes. I don't know if he would take that as an insult or, or a compliment, but that's how he writes. So as we start reading here, I'm going to read the first few verses of Mark, and you're going to, you're going to just be plunged right in and, and be reminded about how fast-paced this story is. He, he skips a lot of details that, that others include, but the ones he includes are for a purpose. Okay, and so let's hear what he has to say. And as I'm reading... We're going to see the power of Jesus showcased from the beginning and set against any other power source out there. So watch for that as we read. And Mark starts by calling this the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So gospel, we know that word means good news. It means the good news of Jesus, who he is, what he did. That's not what it means. At least not when Mark is writing. When Mark is writing, he, this is not a Christian word. This word has nothing to do with Christianity. It has to do with the Roman Empire and Roman politics and Roman paganism. That's where the word gospel actually comes from. People would use that word to refer to, say, like a Roman military victory. So Rome goes out and wins this victory. And then evangelists would come and preach the gospel, the good news of that Roman victory. Or an heir would be born in the royal family and the gospel of that would be preached. You Sometime you should Google, don't, don't do this right now, okay? You should Google... The Gospel of Caesar Augustus. Have you heard of the Gospel of Caesar Augustus? It, we've heard of the Gospel of Mark, but the Gospel of Caesar Augustus. And what this was, was this was an announcement that was preached to the Roman Empire about Caesar Augustus' birthday. This happened when Jesus was growing up. And it was about how Caesar Augustus' birthday was so important and time should be measured according to his birthday and how he was uh, this divine manifestation and he is God and he is Savior and things like that. Gospel of Caesar Augustus. So that's what this word meant to people back then. And here comes Mark and other writers of the New Testament and they totally hijack this word. Don't you love it? It's like in your face. How about this gospel? How about this good news? You, good news about Rome, Caesar, that's nice. How about the gospel of the Son of God? Not, not a, a human posing as divine. The Son of God. So there's this clash, this conflict already between different gospels. Which is a conflict we're familiar with, isn't it? 
Think of the gospels we hear that we're drawn to. The, the, the good news that we kind of put our trust in or that we desire. And here comes the gospel of Jesus and it's set against that. And he says in the next verse, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So these Old Testament prophets like Isaiah, like Malachi and others have said, the Messiah is coming. God is coming for his people. And there will be this messenger that gets the way ready. And who is that? John the Baptist. John the Baptist, verse 4. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country... All the country of Judea and all Jerusalem, the, the entire region is coming out for this. They were going out to him and being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. So lots going on here, but I, I just want us to hang on to this idea that as John is getting people ready to encounter Jesus, what is he doing? He is helping people come to the conclusion I need forgiveness. I'm a sinner. I need a savior. That's what, that's what he's doing. And I don't know how you would picture getting ready to encounter a new king. Maybe being on your best behavior. Maybe dressing your best. You know, putting on airs. Making sure. Well, with Jesus, it's the opposite. John, to get people ready for Jesus, is bringing them to the point where they realize, I need forgiveness. And then they're ready. They're ready for Jesus to come because that is what he's looking for, a people who acknowledge their need of him. And if we today want to encounter Jesus and receive him, whether it's for the first time or in a new way, that's how we prepare ourselves. We recognize I need forgiveness. I need a savior. So this is what John was doing. And it says in verse 6, John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt. Okay, why these details? Well, this is how the prophet Elijah is described in the Old Testament. And there's a connection between Elijah and John the Baptist. Some of you are familiar with this. Old Testament prophets said that before the Messiah would come, there would be another type of Elijah getting ready for him. And Jesus is later going to confirm, yes, John the Baptist, he is that sort of second Elijah type, getting ready. And it says he ate locusts and wild honey. So this is a weird dude, right? Okay. But droves of people, the whole region is coming out. For this, something amazing is going on here. Something powerful is happening. But then here's what John says. This is so interesting. Verse 7. And he preached, saying, After me comes one who is mightier than I. The strap of his sandal I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. You think that I'm powerful? You think this is powerful? What's going on right here? Just wait till you see who comes next, John is saying. Wait till you see who comes next. And then here he comes. We're moving quick. That's how, that's how Mark does it. Verse 9. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee. Now, we're familiar with the, the, the region of Galilee from the Bible, but maybe what we don't know is that Galilee was a very, like, contemptible area. Notice all these people are coming from Judea and Jerusalem. Well, Galilee is like on the other side of the tracks, all right? It's like the slums. It's the place where the people are who have bad grammar and bad morals and so forth. And... Um, the, how many of you are Colorado natives? Let me just ask. You, you raise your hand so proudly, you Colorado natives. I can't raise mine. I was a baby when I moved here, so I can't quite do it. But imagine if Jesus 
rose up out of, not Colorado, but say Nebraska or Kansas. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm sorry, Brent. I know. See, Brent got after me about this in the first service. But see, the, the snobby Colorado people, I'm just trying to make a point here. And <laughs> they're connecting. You know, you can, you can see they're connecting here. But Galilee, that's the kind of place Galilee was. Jesus, and it, not just Galilee, but Nazareth, like the worst town in the worst region. You know, the saying that they had, and we see it, it's quoted in Scripture. Nothing good comes out of Nazareth, right? Well, Jesus did. Jesus did. And Jesus does the bulk of his ministry in Galilee. His miracles, his healings, his exorcisms. As we read the, the, the next few chapters of Mark, that's where he is. And I think that tells us something about the heart of God, doesn't it? That Jesus would come out of that region and focus his ministry so much in that reason. So he comes from Nazareth in Galilee and he was baptized by John in the Jordan. Now if this is a baptism of acknowledging I'm a sinner and I need forgiveness, why would Jesus get baptized? He doesn't have sin to confess. He doesn't need forgiveness. But he's going to take all of the sins of his people on himself and pay for them, isn't he? And maybe that's part of the significance of this act of being baptized. And when he came up out of the water, imagine being here for this. Immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove and a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. This is so gripping. What is going on? What's going to happen next? Well, what happens next is actually kind of shocking. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals. Isn't that a weird detail? To include, he's with the wild animals. Um, I read one commentator who said, you know, these Roman Christians that are being written to here, they knew about the gladiatorial things. They knew about martyrdom in the arena with wild animals. Maybe Mark is saying, you know what? You've got a savior who's been there. And the angels were ministering to him. So here's this like cosmic power clash being shown here. Jesus is out in the wilderness and the angels are with him and he's facing down Satan himself. And that spiritual conflict is going to continue throughout the book of Mark. It's not just at the temptation. There's these confrontations, spiritual confrontations throughout his ministry. And then it says after John was arrested, Jesus came into Nebraska again, Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God. There's the word gospel again too. Here's this new good news. Not about Caesar, about God. Not about the Roman Empire, about this new kingdom. Because he says the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in this gospel. So a couple observations about this kind of introductory section of Mark. And the power of Jesus that we see here. And the first observation that um, strikes me is that the power of Jesus flows out of who he is. It flows out of his identity. And his identity, Mark tells us at the very beginning, in the very first verse. He is the son of God. He's the son of God. Here are these um, Roman leaders claiming to be divine and here's Mark saying, no, here's the Son of God. And sometimes we use uh, phrases like, yeah, we're all children of God, you know. And um, so, yeah, Jesus was one of them and he was a good guy too. And that's not what the Son of God means. The Son of God packs a punch, this title. In fact, when Jesus told the Jewish leaders that God was his father, what was their response? We got to kill him. This is blasphemy. They said he calls God his own father, making himself equal with God. 
And so when Mark says, this is the son of God, he's saying, this is somebody who is equal with God himself. This was God in the flesh, in the world. That's who this is. And when we see the power of Jesus on display, power uh, over sicknesses and diseases and over the weather and over life and death and just the powerful way he speaks to people and teaches and, and gains this following, where does that power come from? It comes from his identity as the son of God himself because that's who he is. And Mark keeps coming back to this title for Jesus. Okay, he says it in the very first verse. Jesus is the son of God. 11 verses later, we just read it. God himself affirms, this is my son. And then in chapter 9, when there's the transfiguration, if you're familiar with that story, again, God speaks from heaven and says, this is my son. The demons understand this is the son of God. Jesus himself eventually outright claims to be the son of God. Now, it's interesting. All through all of this time, nobody else is admitting he's the son of God. The demons are God is, Jesus is. Mark has said it from the beginning. But in these stories, no other human beings respond by saying, okay, yeah, I believe that until chapter 15. Jesus is on the cross. All of these cataclysmic things are happening. You remember the earthquakes and it's dark in the middle of the day and the, in the temple, the curtain is tearing in half. And there's this Roman centurion standing there at the cross looking at Jesus and he is the first one in Mark's record to say, truly this was the son of God. Now, I think that's pretty strategic of Mark writing to Romans to say here's the son of God and nobody's quite sure they agree with that until a Roman centurion at the end of the story and it's like Mark is saying to his readers how about you who do you think this is I mean look at what he does look at what he claims look at what happens around him how are you going to respond to that. And that's the second observation that I want to make of this passage is that the power of Jesus does indeed demand a response from us. We can't just read about him and be like, that's pretty cool, and then walk away and go about our life just like we were before. Like if we really encounter Jesus and see who he is and what he's doing, something happens to us, doesn't it? We've got to respond. And the, the term that I think maybe captures our response or what our response should be, it's mentioned twice in this text, and it's the word repent. Repentance is the only correct response to the power of Jesus. John, his baptism was a baptism of repentance, verse 4. And Jesus, when he begins his ministry and begins preaching, what does he say? He says, repent and believe in the gospel. This is another one of those words that we're familiar with at church, but do we know what it means to repent? Okay, we might think um, repenting uh, means you feel bad about what you've done. Is that repentance? You just, you feel bad about when, or maybe we think repentance is you, you, you change, you, you change your behavior. You stop doing this and you do that instead. And actually those could be related to repentance, but those aren't the actual definition of repent. The actual definition of repent is not a, about feelings. It's not about behavior. It is about your thoughts, your mind. It literally means change your mind change your thought. Get a new mindset. That's what repent means. When Jesus says the kingdom of God is here, repent and believe. I think what he's saying is there's all these other gospels, all these other things that we gravitate toward and that's our mindset and that's what our thoughts surround and he's saying it's time to change your thoughts and your mindset to this kingdom and this king. Which we can't just decide to do, can we? I mean, can we just decide to have a different thought, different mindset? We need some divine help 
doing that. We need, when Jesus preaches that, when Jesus says repent and believe in the gospel, we need to hear that and let his words like empower us and change us while he's saying that. So um, here's how I want to end. I've been thinking for a long time now about how I would hope we respond to the power of God. If we're going to be looking at the power of God in this gospel, how should we respond as individuals and as a church community? And here's what I would hope for, all right? I would hope for these three things. We should respond with passionate worship, bold prayers, unleashed gifts. So here's what I mean by these three things. Okay, first of all, passionate worship. When we see the power of God and we actually believe it, we actually believe, yes, this is who he is. This is what he did. That should, that should stir something up in us, shouldn't it? I mean, we should be brought to our knees. We should be in awe of who Jesus is. Uh, and, and the other things that we might worship or that we might think very highly of or give our devotion, our attention to, they should just fade away compared to him. Passionate worship. When we were singing this morning, if you were, I mean, if we were tuned in to the words that we were singing and the one we were singing about and, and what we were saying about him, there was no way we could just kind of stand there and not feel anything, was there? I mean, that's not possible when you encounter Jesus. It prompts worship, real worship. Not just in a gathering like this, but with a ripple effect beyond it. So passionate worship, bold prayers. If this is the Lord, and if he's who he says he is, and if he has the, the power that we see here, and he invites us to pray in his name, and he says he hears that, and that there is a response to that, man, we can't just have a mediocre prayer life knowing that, can we? I mean, what should we be, if, if we think, that, okay, this is who he is, this is what he's about, what should we be asking for? And I know it's, there's, there's teaching out there that basically says, you know, if you're living your life the way you should and you have the amount of faith you should, then you just ask God for whatever and he kind of has to do it because you have the faith and, and it's like it makes us God instead of God. And I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, look at this Person, look at this Lord, and if this is our Lord, who we have, and we have his ear, and his love, what should we be asking him for? Uh, Kathy Fadal, the director of our women's ministry and children's ministry, she said that this year, what she's praying for, for the children's ministry, is that God would do surprisingly wonderful things. Maybe things that we haven't even thought of surprisingly wonderful things. And I like, you know, I'm just going to steal that prayer because that's a good one. God, surprise us. Like, do, do these amazing things that would just blow us away. We're like, oh, thank you, God. And she says, we're going to ask for that because, you know, as it says in James, we don't have because we don't ask. We don't have because we don't ask. Now, I Sometimes God does things we don't ask, right? Thank God. He just steps right in and blesses us and does these awesome things. And we're just wandering around oblivious. And he still just does it because he's gracious. But apparently, there are certain things that God is ready to do. Like on the edge of his seat, ready to do for you and for us. If we will ask and he won't if we don't. And I don't know about you, but man, I don't want to miss out on any of that. Like, let's never let it be said we could have had this blessing, but we didn't ask for it. We were too distracted or busy or, what, or whatever it was. And so we didn't ask. And so we didn't. Like, let's not let that be true of us. Let's ask for great things. And then just watch. Watch what God does. Because if this is our powerful Savior, we should be praying boldly. We need to walk right into the presence of God because of what Jesus did. 
So passionate worship, bold prayers, unleashed gifts. It's crazy what John said would happen. This king who's coming is going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He's going to actually immerse you, put the power of the Spirit of God himself in your life. That's what he's going to do. This power that we're talking about, it's not just Jesus doing things, it's Jesus deploying people, people like us, with that power. Isn't that crazy to think about? And you read the book of Acts and the Spirit comes upon the church and you read 1 Corinthians and the Spirit of God gifts all believers, any of us in this room that's a believer in Jesus, we've been empowered by the Spirit of God in a unique way to contribute something unique to his kingdom. Well, let's figure out what that is. Yeah, so this year for Calvary, I, my prayer, my hope is that all of us are discovering or rediscovering or renewing the way that we're gifted to contribute and that God just turns us loose. And then we see some incredible things happen through us because this power of the King of Kings, it's our power because we're his people and he's given it to us. Let's pray. We thank you that we have your power, Jesus. Thank you that it was not a power you used to simply take over the world, but you, you took over us. You changed us. You, you used that power to face down evil. You used that power to go to the cross and pay for sin and come back from the dead and call us to yourself and empower us. So God, we just praise you for that. And Jesus, the more we see of that and the more we encounter you in our life and through these pages, Lord, just let that uh, move us to respond to you and see you do some amazing things in us and in our church. Even right now, Jesus, while we're singing about you and thinking about you, I pray that our eyes are opened a little wider to who you are and what you're up to. In your name we pray, amen.